We're going to talk about mercy and grace, and then the works that, that follow after that. And we've been looking at the book of Titus the past several weeks, so if you have your Bibles this morning, we turn to Titus, and we're looking at chapter 3. And a couple of important things to discuss here in the third chapter of Titus, as Paul is wrapping up his letter, and he covers a, a variety of topics, of course, everything ultimately tying together. But in, in Titus chapter 3, remember, Titus was a Greek, and he oversaw the churches on the island of Crete. And the inhabitants of Crete were known for, as we said before, lazy, lying, gluttony, evil ways. And that's not a very pleasant group of people by and large. Except for those who accepted Jesus Christ who came into the church. But they still had old habits. And uh, part of Pastor Titus's job was to try to teach them ways of the Lord. To teach them how a Christian should behave and uh, how important that is to your witness. So if you're out there and you're talking to folks and uh, you're in the workplace or wherever you might be in your neighborhood. And you say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian and I go to that that Bible Evangelical Church, and uh, you know, read my Bible and, and pray, and then your actions don't back up what you say, there's going to be some questions, and uh, they, those questions deserve to be answered. So Titus uh, was running into a situation with the folks there on Crete, and uh, you know, they said, well, we belong to this new church, uh, Jesus uh, that was the Messiah, apparently he died and he's rose again, and now he's in heaven, and we believe, but on the other hand, we still have some old habits, some bad habits that we need to purge ourselves from. And so Titus uh, was being encouraged by Paul to say, stick with them, work with them, and the Holy Spirit will also deal with them and, and help them understand what it means to, to lead a Christian life. And of course, as you get more into the Word of God, uh, you'll take on that persona uh, of the Word of God. You'll take on the, the vestitures of Christ, and you'll become more like Him each and every day, the sanctification process. So Paul continues to encourage Titus and gives him some practical instruction in chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Put them in mind... To be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. So what he's saying here is just because these folks have become Christians and that their God is no longer the God of this world, their God is in heaven, is the Heavenly Father, doesn't mean that we ignore the people who are in authority over us here in this earth. It says, put those folks, those new converts in mind, to be subject to the principalities and, and powers and to obey the people in authority. Obey the, obey the people who have been elected or appointed or however they got into office over you because, again, as part of your testimony as a Christian is to be a good citizen. And a good citizen obeys the laws and obeys uh, those authorities above them and be ready to every good work. Now, the Greek word about put them in mind, Paul is using a Greek word that says, keep reminding them. So it's not just good enough to, remember, to tell them one time, oh yeah, you should obey the civil authorities, but to remind them over and over again because apparently they needed reminding over and over again. And it's tough in some cases, I think even for Christians today, when we see what our government is doing in many cases, and not just the federal government, but state governments and local governments, they seem to keep hammering against the, the Christian faith and the Christian testimony in particular to keep in mind that we are still supposed to be respectful of those people in authority. Whether you agree or not with their politics, we should still be a respectful people. We can witness to them, and we can share the love of Christ with them and God's law with them, but we do so in a respectful manner. And so Paul's reminding, telling Titus to remind them to do that. Now, when their law, of course, conflicts with God's law directly, we always go with God's law, but we can still even do that in a respectful way and say, I'm sorry, but I cannot go along with that law. Uh, I will be a religious, conscientious objector in this particular case, and I will not follow that law because it violates God's uh, own word. But again, you can do that in a respectful way. Verse 2, to speak evil of no man. Well, that uh, just puts a damper on everything right away, doesn't it? To speak evil of no man, including people in government that we may not agree with. We can disagree with their policies. We can disagree with their votes. But we shouldn't have personal attacks against them. So to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers or fighters, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, or all respect again unto all men, even those with whom we disagree. Even if it's somebody in your workplace, you may disagree with your boss, for example, but we still should respect the position the boss holds. Even if the boss uh, really doesn't deserve the respect, but as a Christian, you still give him or her due respect, and if they're doing something wrong, well, there's probably things within your, your company to do, take appropriate action, but you still respect them, you don't take personal attacks out against them. For we ourselves, in verse 3 also, were sometimes foolish. Paul says, remember when we were, what we were like before we became Christians? We used to be foolish. We used to speak uh, badly about other people. We used to do things, uh, nefarious things, and perhaps even some illegal things. Of course, you remember what Paul did. Paul was 
out there, he was persecuting and helping to kill Christians at the time. So Paul, you know, he's speaking from, hey, remember me, remember where I came from, and I have turned over and I now accept Jesus Christ as a Messiah. Uh, so I'm speaking from someone who has that kind of experience. So if, it, if I can turn a new leaf, if I can turn it over, then certainly all of you can do as well. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. We were disobedient. We deceived. We served a diver's lust and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy. We were hateful. We hated one another. Paul is laying it right out there. He's saying that I was a no-good scoundrel too at one time. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. After God took control of my heart, I became an entirely new man. So we use the phrase born again. You were once born into this world and you had this sinful nature and you had this hate and you had this callousness and you had this meanness uh, and you did this disrespect and that was the default switch because we had the, 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 the spirit of this world. But when I became born again spiritually, I became a new man inside and out. And then all of a sudden, I didn't do the things that I used to do. I was no uh, longer hating people, living in malice, and, and just serving my own personal pleasures. But I became a new person. That the kindness and love of God, our Savior, is what made the change in my life. And He can do the same for you. So He's again reminding Titus to remind the people in His church that they can, they can change as well too. And if, if you've truly received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shouldn't even have that kind of thing in your heart anymore. Because he will change you from the inside out. Now there may be some old habits that you have to work through and, and things like that, but your default switch has changed. And now your, your default switch is the love, the agape love of God in your heart. Notice he says here, After the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness. So you can't earn this. And just by doing good things, even if your heart has changed, you say, well, I've done so many bad things. I need to really you know, do as many good things as the bad things as I used to do to make up for it. Well, that's not what God is looking for. Good works are fine, but what He's really concerned about is your heart has changed. The good works will come if your heart has truly changed because now, instead of hating your fellow man, you will love your fellow man as Christ first loved him. And He loved him so much that He gave up His life for them, whether or not they even chose to follow Him. That's how much He loved them. So we now love God's creation as well. We now love all those who were created in His image also. And we want to be nice to them. We want to do good things. We want to help those, especially those who are uh, uh, financially uh, in a situation where it's dire consequences. People may be in ill health. People who have no family around them. People who are disadvantaged one way or another. Our heart goes out to them because we now have the heart and mind of Christ. And our heart and our mind goes out to them as well. So it's not by works, however, of righteousness which we have done that makes us feel this way, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. God showed His mercy towards us that He would say, I will send my only begotten Son to die on a cross for your sin. He didn't have to do that, by the way. And God still would have been a God of love because we were the guilty ones. We are the ones who should have been nailed to that cross to pay our own debt and to pay for our own sin. But because God is merciful, He sent His own Son to pay the debt for us. So not by works of righteousness, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now in and of itself, response to an altar call, coming forward during the invitation, that response itself does not save you. Saying a sinner's prayer does not save you. Baptism doesn't save you. Church attendance doesn't save you. Giving does not save you. Reading the Bible itself does not save you. They are all works. These things come as a result of being saved, but they themselves don't save you. Each of these may be wonderful works of righteousness, but, righteousness, but they don't save us. It's instead according to His mercy that He offered us the gift of salvation, and by His grace we can be saved if we accept this gift of salvation that He's come towards us. After that, the good works should just flow from us naturally because we are now like Christ. In verse 7, that being justified by His grace. And there it is. God's grace towards us. That we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we are now children of God. We are adopted into the family. Jesus is our big brother. And uh, He's also our Savior. And we are the children of God. And we have all the rights uh, that come with being uh, one of the heirs of God Himself. This is a faithful saying, Paul says, 
And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. So it does come, but they which have believed, past tense, have believed in God, then be careful to maintain good works. And people will know that you're a Christian by the things that you say and the things that you do. So again, if you have that, uh, you say you have a change in your heart, but nothing has been manifested, there's no physical evidence, I have to question whether or not your heart truly changed. Because if your heart truly changed, that changes who you are, and it changes the things that you do. And if you now are doing different things than you used to do before, and you're doing things that benefit those around you and that show love for the people around you, that's evidence that your heart has truly changed. He says again, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So we can be blessed and be a blessing to others around us because of the things that we do for them, because we have a heart for them, as we use that phrase. Our heart is God's changing of our heart. We have now God's heart for them. Uh, the late pastor J. Hampton Keithley III wrote and said, Christians live in two spheres. On the one hand, Christians are citizens of a heavenly kingdom with Christ as their Lord. On the other hand, they are called of Christ to represent Him in the midst of an age that is passing away and in a world system that is opposed to the plan and purposes of God. They live in the world, but they are not of the world. How many times have you maybe thought to yourself, you know, wouldn't it be great if uh, we became Christians and then just God took us to heaven? Right then and there, we wouldn't have to put up with any pain or sorrow. We would just immediately just leave the world and that would be it. We would spend all eternity in God's glory and God's heaven. Everything would be beautiful and perfect and, and uh, there would be no more pain, sorrow, tears. Everything would just be wonderful. But it doesn't work that way because then who would be left to witness to those who were left behind? So we have a plan. We have a purpose for being here. Again, so Keith Lee was saying that we do live in a world that's passing away, in a world system that is opposed to the plans and purposes of God. So God has a plan and a purpose. His plan is to save the whole world. His purpose is that everybody would go to heaven one day. The invitation is extended to everybody in the world, but how do we get that invitation out? We are the, the ministers. We are the ones who proclaim the gospel. Some of us do it behind a formal pulpit. Some do it in a... Sunday school setting, some do it in a children's church or in a vacation Bible school, but most of you probably just do it one-on-one, one-on-two. -on -one, you're talking to a co-worker, you're talking to a family member, you're talking to a neighbor. Uh, you, they may ask a question, maybe they say, I don't understand why there's so much evil in the world. Why is this happening? Well, there's your opening to explain uh, what's going on in the world and that this is not God's plan for the world, but it, the, the God of this world, he, he wants evil and bad things to happen. But thank God I serve the, the God who is above all that. And in one day, the knee of evilness will bow to my God, my Savior, Jesus Christ. John 15, 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love its, his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So if the world hates you, you're doing something right. If the world wonders why you won't go out and party and uh, be a mess and do all the nasty things that the world does, and they call you a killjoy, they say you're no fun, and they don't have anything to do with you because you won't go out and get drunk and do drugs or do this or that or the other, or steal or cheat or lie, well then you're probably doing something right. Because we have no desire to do those things. Maybe we did it one time. Some of you uh, have perhaps a more checkered past than others, but you can even more appreciate perhaps the fact of what Jesus did and the transformation that took place in your life. I've run into a number of people say, you know, Pastor, I'm so ashamed of the person I was before. I mean, I can't even tell you that some of the things that I used to do. And I'd say, that's fine. I don't need to hear that. But I'm glad to hear the testimony that you don't do those anymore because you have no desire. For those of you who used to do that, do you remember how much you used to look forward to Friday night or Saturday night, the big party, or doing this or that or the other, how much you enjoyed doing that, and how much you didn't enjoy mom and dad dragging you to the church on Sunday mornings when you were a kid or dragging you to, you know, uh, Sunday school or something like that, but now you actually look forward to it. Now you actually enjoy the company of fellow Christians. You now and, and those things that you used to do just don't hold any appeal anymore. I don't want to go out and destroy my body anymore with you know substances and things, and I don't want to get tangled up in a web of lies and try to have to you know keep this story straight for this person, but a slightly different story straight for this person because if the two of them ever met, then, you know, then they would see that I was a liar or, or a cheat or whatever it might be. Those things just don't hold any appeal anymore as a Christian. They should not. 
And the world will recognize the fact that you're no longer playing their game, and so they don't have any use for you. You're boring to them. Well, you know, you used to be fun, but now no more. But that means you're doing something right. John 17, 14 also said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They hated Jesus, hated him so much, they scourged him, crucified him, tried to kill him off. Well, we're supposed to be Jesus to the world, so if they hated him then, they should probably just naturally hate us now. Because what we do when we shine the light of Christ, we expose them for who they are. We expose the sin in their life. Not that we're trying to point out, oh, well, you're a cheater, you're a liar, you're gluttonous, you're prideful. You don't we don't go around pointing fingers like that, but when they compare themselves to us, and we don't do those things, it makes them look bad, it makes them feel guilty. It's embarrassing. So that's why they, don't want to, they want to back off from the light of Christ that's in us. Not that we're super perfect all the time, but hopefully we are striving towards that holiness in our life. And they see that we are trying to become more and more like Christ every day. And so when they compare that, they are not becoming more and more like Christ. In fact, they may be becoming more and more like Satan every day, the God of this world, their God. They can see that the gap is widening and widening day by day. So they don't want anything to do with us. As those who live in this world, they are to live as aliens and sojourners and as ambassadors for the Savior without being contaminated by the age of the world system whose God is the devil himself. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It should be natural. It should be your default switch. And be not conformed to this world. So don't try to fit in with the world. Don't try to be like the people in the world. The world will present a glitzy and a glossy, uh, you know, facade. So you have the red carpets and, you know, all the stars are dressed up in their, their tuxedos and their fine evening wear and they have all the makeup and the hair is done. And, and then the paparazzi follows the celebrities around snapping pictures and, you know, they're posing and all these sorts of things and voguing and doing whatever it is. Oh, what a glamorous life. And then somebody goes in with a TV camera, the lifestyles of the rich and the famous, and they have the big mansions and the infinity pools and all this kinds of thing. And everybody, uh, the idea is that, oh, I just lust after that. Wouldn't that be great? I could, I could spread out in a 10,000 square foot mansion with the several pools and a tennis court and that sort of thing. And, and all I have to do is just compromise to everything I am. All I have to do is just be a, a rapper and spews filth out of my mouth and people will buy my records and they'll, they'll send me lots of money. All I have to do is compromise my moral integrity and be an actor and actress and, and do all kinds of nasty things on a, on a uh, movie screen or on TV and people will pay me uh, obscene amounts of money and then I can have all these great things and that's what the world is saying. Or I can just cheat people. I can develop some sort of Ponzi scheme. I don't have to be a celebrity to do that. Cheat people, cheat uh, uh, elderly folks out of their pensions and out of their life savings. You hear these stories in the newspaper and on TV all the time. But then I get to live the big life. I get to go on worldwide vacations and I can have uh, you know, extra houses down in the, in the Caribbean and I can do this and that and the other. And that's the facade that the world presents to you. This is the life. This is what we should be doing. This is what we should be striving to do. They have no concept of the life hereafter. They're only looking at what's immediately in front of them. But as Christians, we see the big picture. We see that this life is temporary, as we saw all too soon. Uh, those who've lost loved ones uh, at a younger age, all too soon. There's no guarantee that any one of us will be able to take the next breath or that we'll live again by tomorrow. We may not even make it home from church today. Are we ready, though, to enter into eternity where everything will be genuinely perfect and beautiful and pure and holy for all eternity? That's the big picture. First Peter, and remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do, so you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. We're temporary. We're sojourners. We're, we're pilgrims. This isn't our home. We're just residing here for now. We're just, we're just renting space. But our permanent home is in heaven. As Augustine wrote in his book, The City of God, there are two cities, the city of man and the city of God. The city of man being the product of his pride and rebellion against God reflects man's dreams, earthly hopes, and values. This is an earthly city, a city of this age and Satan's world system. It's temporal, fundamentally opposed to God, and ultimately ruinous to man. However, there is another city with firm foundations 
whose builder and maker is God. This is the city of God with God's values, plans of salvation, and one that endures forever. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to reside permanently. Well, as I mentioned earlier in my prayer, there is a lot of persecution going on. And Dr. James Emery White, a well-known pastor, wrote a blog, and I want to share a few comments with you. He says, what is happening in America is an increasing hostility and intolerance toward Christian beliefs and values that many perceive to be an attack on religious freedom. In current American culture, you are free to be a Christian as long as you don't actually live out your faith, vote your faith, take a stand in relation to your faith, or believe others should embrace your faith. Other than that, you're fine. In other words, he says, it can be privately engaging, that is your faith, but must remain socially irrelevant. You now what's interesting is that the rest of the world doesn't mind sharing their faith, their faith in themselves, or faith in the God of this world, and they're more than happy to expound that every possible opportunity they can, but as soon as we share our faith, oh no, no. Now you're politically incorrect, you're intolerant, you're a bigot, you're prejudiced, and blah, blah, blah. He says, there is a real concern that the growing insistence that faith be privatized has now become a demand for faith to be compromised. So at first they said, you just got to keep it to yourself. But they didn't stop there. They said, that's not good enough. Now you have to compromise your own faith. It's not enough that your beliefs can't influence society. You must also embrace society's beliefs. As Jonah Goldberg noted in USA Today, the opposition to many Christian values has become an if you're not with us, you're against us mentality. It used to be maybe a live and let live. Okay, well, you're a Christian. Well, that's fine. I'm, you know, I'm not a Christian. I, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. And, you know, that's it. We'll walk away. But now that's not enough. Now it's, oh, you're a Christian. Well, now you need to change what you believe. You need to change your faith. You need to now embrace my faith. Otherwise, you're intolerant. You're the one who's politically incorrect. He says, the recent decision to require most religious institutions, including Catholic hospitals and schools, to pay for contraception, sterilizations, and the morning after pill is simply the most current case in point. For many, this was about government coercion of religious individuals and institutions. These were private institutions that he's discussing here. Now, here's the problem uh, that I will say about these institutions and why the government felt like they could step in. They took government money. And when you, as soon as you start taking money from the government, the government now has the right to say, here's what you get to do with the money. You want our money? That's fine. We'll give you gobs of money, but now you've got to do what we tell you to do. And that's why we want to stay away from the government intrusion. We will not accept government grants or government money or anything like that because we want to stay pure to the Word of God. And we know that the Word of God and the government is often now at loggerheads, diametrically opposed to each other in many cases. Uh, White goes on to say, the developing fear is that government will make people choose between obeying the law and following their faith. And he lists a couple of examples. He said, Catholic Charities in Illinois shut down its adoption services rather than place children with same-sex couples as the state required. Um, a, clerk, a court clerk in New York was told to issue same-sex marriage licenses despite religious reservations. And a wedding photographer was sued for refusing to shoot a same-sex wedding. And then also there was a a uh, couple that made wedding cakes in Colorado, and they've lost their business now because they refuse to make a wedding cake for a gay wedding. And so it's that, or it's the abortion, uh, the Hobby Lobby uh, decision that just recently came down, actually came down in their favor, but the big uh, company based in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we're very familiar with Hobby Lobby when we lived out there, and all kinds of arts and crafts and so forth, run by the Green family, which is an evangelical Christian family, and they offered all kinds of health benefits to their employees. They, they pay their employees very well and take care of their employees. Lots of great benefits. And the government tried to say, tried to say you must include the morning after pill in your, in your health plan. And they said, we don't believe in that. We believe that's abortion. And once the uh, fer fertilization takes place, it's now a child. And we don't do that. There are 21 ways, 21 uh, uh, things that, that can be offered in a health plan to help with family planning. Hobby Lobby offered 19 of the 21. Only two others they didn't offer, one of them was the morning after pill, and I figured what the other one thing was. So it's not like they were holding out on women and they were discriminating against the women in their company or anything like that, or they were pushing them down or treating them as second-class citizens. In fact, just the opposite, they were saying, in effect, well, you know, once the, uh, the, the baby is ready, you know, is, the egg is fertilized, and now it's a, it's a baby in utero, it might be a, a little girl. And you're saying it's okay for us to kill a little girl that's in utero? That doesn't make any logical sense at all whatsoever. 
But these are the kinds of things that the government is coming down and starting to try to implement around the country. Now, in our particular case, and I hesitate to admit to this, but I'll say it anyway, because I doubt that anybody in our local government probably watches the, the tape anyway. But the churches here in Kennett Square uh, are blessed that we don't have to pay for water and sewer. It goes way back to whenever they first instituted that. You know, churches used to be held in high esteem. Uh, pastors used to be uh, held with uh, respect even by the world uh, standards and so forth. But one of the things that uh, they do is that they give us free water and sewer in the borough. Well, what the government could do, start doing for us, even though we don't take any government money, they can't force us to do, uh, you know, make a compromise and make us you know, hire non-Christians for you know, whatever uh, employees of the church, but they could start charging us things because we do tap into, into the borough's water and sewer system. And by law, we're not allowed to have our own well here in the borough. So it's not that we could avoid that at all. Tax exemption for any nonprofit organization, but especially churches. We enjoy that as a church. You, you have the opportunity and you enjoy by giving your gifts and tithes and offerings to the church to write that off your taxable income every April 15th. It would not surprise me, perhaps within our lifetime and perhaps even not that far away, the government may take that away from you. Say, oh, we need the money. We can't afford to give you a tax break. You need to pay taxes on 100% of your income. So no longer will you be able to get a tax uh, break by giving to your church. Now, of course, uh, the, the Satan, I'm sure, is thinking, well, if that, do that, that'll drive the church's funds. Churches will no longer be able to operate because nobody will ever give money anymore to a church when they can't get a tax benefit out of it. But I have more faith, and I believe that it won't affect churches hardly at all, especially, I believe, true Bible-believing churches, because we don't give to get the tax break. We give because we're sowing into God's ministry. We're sowing into the kingdom. And what's more important than a tax break is being able to uh, preach and witness to people who don't know Jesus Christ so they will become born again. But these are the kinds of things that we see where Christians are being persecuted, even by our own government, in subtle ways. And someday it may not be quite so subtle. It says, in each case, the Christians involved were not attempting to impose their religious views on others. They simply didn't want to be forced to participate or offer tacit support for something they felt was in violation of their religious conscience. Back to Titus, chapter 3, verse 9. But avoid, Paul says, avoid foolish, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. So the religious leaders of the day have thought, well, now we need to start you know, justifying our existence. We have all this uh, knowledge. We've learned the, the Torah. We know the Old Testament very well. Now there's this new theology. We need to pick it apart. We need to see if we can find inconsistencies and see if we can find contradictions. And Paul says, avoid the foolish questions and genealogies. And they were trying to trace back uh, Jewish genealogy all the way back to Adam. And, for, and that became so important. Well, I'm of this particular line, and I'm of this tribe, and I'm of that tribe. And, and they were trying to, it was a prideful thing. I'm of the tribe of Judah, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm of the tribe of, of Issachar, and whatever tribes that they were of. And so it was becoming a very prideful thing. And they were spending all their time working on these genealogies instead of their time preaching and proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And Paul says it's foolish. The actual Greek word there is moros. That's where we get our word moronic. It says, don't be moronic about this. Don't ask these foolish or stupid questions. Don't waste your time in genealogies and strivings about the law. They are unprofitable and vain. They're prideful. It has been said that there is a danger that a man may think himself religious because he discusses religious questions. That doesn't make you religious. Verse 10, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject don't have anything to do with that person. Knowing that he is he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So a man is a heretic after you go to him and say, Brother, I perceive that you're doing something that is contradictory to the word of God. I'd like to come and love and, and point that out to you. It'd be embarrassing, I'm sure, to them. It's probably awkward for the person who confronts that friend or that person, but says, you know, what you're doing or what you're saying is not in line with the word of God. And he says there... Uh, the man is a heretic after the first and second admonition. You have to go to him a second time if they don't repent, if they don't change the ways. And he says, reject. Don't have anything to do with them. We saw this in Matthew earlier. Uh, you may recall this, uh, uh, this scripture perhaps more readily in Matthew chapter 18. It says, Moreover, if thy brethren shall trespass or sin against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Go privately. Go, you know, if somebody's done something, done you wrong, go to them privately. If he shall hear thee, 
thou hast gained thy brother. If the person you've gone to privately says, you know, you're right, I'm sorry, I did do you wrong, please forgive me and maybe make restitution as the case may be, you've gained a brother. And they appreciate the fact that you came and pointed it out to them. You know, sometimes people can be so wrapped up in themselves that they offend other people don't even realize they've offended them. So they may not even realize that they've hurt your feelings or done something wrong to you. If you go to them privately and say, you know what, what you just said kind of hurt my feelings and kind of offended me and here's why. And if they say, oh, I had no idea, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, I just, I got wrapped up in whatever it was, I say, please forgive me. You've gained a brother. They appreciate the fact that you pointed it out to them. On the other hand, as we continue to read, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more in that, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. You know, you may not have realized that you offended or hurt a lot of people, but here's two or three other people that also felt the same way. So you go to them again, not trying to make a show of them, not trying to embarrass them publicly, but say, you know what, it wasn't just me, but here's two or three other people. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, some people, I think, have taken this a little too far, and they've actually stood up in a pulpit and said, you're a sinner, and here's what you did. I want the whole church to know what you did. And they start pointing fingers at each other. And what they really mean there is by, by the witnesses, by the people of the church who are affected by this particular situation. It's not meant to publicly disparage somebody, publicly ridicule them, because that won't help. They'll just put up a wall, thicker wall of defense at that point. But the idea is that there are witnesses, and there are people that they've hurt, that they've cheated, that they've lied to, whatever it is that they've done wrong to them, and if they won't, in the, even in the face of all these witnesses, and telling them that what they did was wrong, and they still refuse to acknowledge that and accept that, then you have to cut them off. So all that, going back to Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, is what Paul is getting to. In verse 12, he says, and he wraps things up here, give you a little bit of history and geography lesson, as he wraps up this letter to Titus, again, talking to Pastor Titus, can I just kind of remind you of what you know, the Christian church should be all about. It says, when I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. Now Nicopolis was on the western coast of Greece, and Artemis and Tychicus would take over Titus' work on the island of Crete so that Titus could meet with Paul and meet him in Nicopolis. Uh, Tychicus was one of Paul's trusted companions, and Titus would leave, and he needed to leave soon because the winter season was coming, and it was very dangerous to, to sail along the Mediterranean during the winter season. So he wanted him to leave, and he was going to say, here are two people that, from what I've heard from you, and from what I can see, these two people may be mature enough to kind of help you know, uh, minister in your absence. While you're coming to meet me, Titus, put these two in charge, and I think that you know, the church will be in good shape if you'll, you'll do that. So Titus has started the process of developing mature Christians, and sort of the next generation, the people who will come to follow and take care, be caretakers of the church. You know, very similar to what we have as an elder board these days in our churches. Uh, Apollos was a famous preacher, by the way, and was a native of Alexandria in North Africa, and became a Christian in Ephesus and was trained by Aquila and Priscilla. In verse 14, and let us and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful, all that are with me salute thee, greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And that's Paul's letter to Titus. His concern for the church. And he says, you know, remember the church didn't have the whole New Testament like we have now. I mean, the, when the church received this letter from Paul, they didn't realize that they were probably realized they were already reading what is now Holy Writ. But it was still good and it still should, they, you know, took it to heart. So now we are of the vantage here in the church age and we have the entire Old Testament and New Testament at our disposal. We have absolutely no excuse whatsoever, not that they did either. They knew what was right, and if you have the heart of God and the mind of God in you, you know what's right because the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to you each and every day. And so when you're going about your day and you think you're going to go do something, you get a little check in your mind or in your heart, you know, don't do that, or don't say that. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. A lot of people want to walk around or looking for the audible voice out of heaven and say, don't do that. <laughs> don't go there. Now that's not the way it works. If you have the Word of God in you, God can bring the Word of, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit can bring Scripture back to your mind and lead you that way. Uh, you know, my mother always used to say to me when I was having some of these discussions with her as a young child I and mean, even as a teen, she said, basically, most of the time, if in doubt, don't. If you have a Christian heart and a Christian mind, you have doubt about doing something, whether it's right or wrong, don't do it. 
probably that check of the Holy Spirit. So that's the, the admonition for us today. Now in our church today, here we are, 2,000 years later, and still have some of the same issues in our church. We still have churches out there that are very liberal in their theology and don't, for whatever reason, seem to be want to follow the, uh, the teachings of the Bible and go off in their own direction. And uh, they will stand before the judgment throne one day, and they'll, they'll answer for their actions. God will be the judge, but we know that uh, we can't go wrong if we follow the Word of God. If you do that, you're going to be completely safe. So let's do that this morning. Let's renew our commitment to follow the Word of God and to listen to the voice of God by the Holy Spirit, and we can't go wrong. If for some reason, however, we do find that we have strayed from the path, the good news, of course, is that we can stop immediately and confess that sin and repent, and God will forgive us. 70 times 7, and on and on and on. That should give us great comfort in our lives today. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word and your blessings and the encouragement that we received this morning. We thank you for uh, your most precious word and the admonition we have as a church body to live our lives as Christians, to live our lives in a way that pleases you because you see everything that we do. You hear every word that we say. You even know every thought that we think. How embarrassing is that? When we come before you, we think about the things that entered our mind this past 24 hours even. But we know that we can confess those sins to you, and we can repent. And then you will wipe all those sins away, separate us uh, from our sins as far as the east is from the west. And we give you great glory, and, and uh, we give you great praise for that. Perhaps there is someone here this morning, though, who is ready to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're ready to change your life. You're ready to stop following the God of this world. You're ready to stop trying to please people in this world. You just want to please God. That's all we ask. We're not asking you to even please us as fellow Christians. We just want, we just want to please God in all that we say them and, and we do. We're not going to answer to man. We're going to answer to God. So if there's someone here this morning who wants to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, put away the God of this world, invite Him into your heart and into your life. Proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, as the only begotten Son of God. He will come into your life and He will change, and the Holy Spirit will reside in you. You will become a temple of God Himself, the presence of God this morning. As Christians this morning, perhaps we all have something we may need to confess, maybe even on our way to church, we did something that wouldn't please you, and we need to confess that right now. So hear our prayers, Father. We, forgive, uh, we ask forgiveness, we confess our sins, we repent of those sins. We thank you that you are a merciful God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for cleansing us from all unrighteousness as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.